Hi, everyone. This is Natalia Blauvelt. I am an immigration attorney with McKenzie, and today we are going to do the, a K-1 visa webinar online. And I see that some people joined the webinar. That's great. We'll wait for more people to join. Okay, while we're waiting on people to join the webinar, I just want to once again introduce myself. I'm Natalia Blauvelt. I'm an immigration attorney with McKenzie. I practice immigration law here in Chicago, but as you know, immigration law is federal, so we can practice in any state in the US. And just quick disclaimers, before we start this webinar on the K-1 visa, this presentation is for general information purposes only. It is not a legal advice. I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney. So please contact an attorney for an individual advice pertaining to your specific immigration matter. And all timelines provided in this presentation are estimates as of the date of this presentation. The timelines change so please pay attention to the processing timelines on the USCIS website for the current timelines. Um, the timelines change because the US government has different workload at a certain time. It may have not enough immigration officers adjudicating the case. Or like we know, three years ago, the pandemic happened and it also caused a lot of um, delays for the USCIS and the consulates. So please make sure you follow the USCIS processing timelines to see the timelines for your specific matter at a given date. Our law firm, McKenzie Law Group, is located in Chicago and we're a boutique law firm. Uh, we practice immig immigration law exclusively. We do business immigration, family-based immigration, and removal defense. We also work with consulates and we help our clients with consulate processing. All right, here is some information about me. Um, all right, I think we're ready to start. Before we start this webinar, I just wanted to give you quick definitions of some of the terms that we are going to use in this webinar. Fiance is someone someone um, from outside of the U.S., a foreign national who is engaged but not legally married in any country. And this person should be engaged to a U.S. citizen specifically for the purposes. This is for the purposes of the K-1 webinar exclusively. A spouse is someone who is legally married to a US citizen or lawful permanent resident. For the K-1 purposes, it has to be a US citizen who the spouse should be married to, and the marriage can happen in any country. So as long as the marriage is valid in, in the place where it was um, done, then the marriage is valid for immigr US immigration purposes. Minor children of fiances, they can obtain K-2 visas, so it's important to mention them as well. Those are unmarried children under 21. They can apply for a K-2 visa. They can accompany the parent, the K-1 fiance, to come to the U.S., or they may apply for a K-2 visa at a later time. If they apply at a later time, then the child's visa application must be made within one year of the date of the parent's fiancé visa issuance date. So this is very important, and there are some very important deadlines that are related to the K-1 process. And I will talk about all of them during this webinar. So the goal of the K-1 fiancé visa is for the foreign nationals to come to the US to get married. 
This visa was specifically designed for those foreign nationals who intend to get married in the U.S. So the sole purpose of traveling to the U.S. on a K-1 visa should be to get married in the United States within 90 days from the date of arrival. After people get married in the U.S., there will be an option to file for a green card. Um, so filing for a green card is a process that is included in the K-1 and AOS visa process. So we normally represent our clients um, on the K-1 entire process, which includes the AOS adjustment of status in the U.S. But sometimes we are hired to handle just the adjustment of status or just the K-1 visa specifically for the consular processing. We can do either one uh, and we can discuss engagement agreements pertaining to either process or the entire process um, from the K-1 visa to the AOS in the United States. Next, I would like to talk about the criteria for the K-1 fiancé visa. Like I said, this kind of visa is intended only for fiancés of U.S. citizens. So it cannot be a fiancé of a lawful permanent resident. This specific kind of visa is reserved for the fiancés of U.S. citizens, naturalized or born um, in the U.S or outside of the US, but those who are deemed US citizens. So this visa is intended only for fiancés of US citizens who seek to enter the US solely to conclude a valid marriage with a US petitioner. The couple also has to get married within 90 days. If the couple does not get married within 90 days to each other, then the foreign national has to leave the United States. Also, the, each, um, the beneficiary and the petitioner cannot be married legally in any other country. And like I mentioned before, US citizens can sponsor their fiance minor child on a K-2 visa, which is an iceberg. Um, the K-1 visa, um, has a very specific procedure that we all need to follow and pay attention to the forms and to the additional documents that we submit for the K-1 processing. So the whole process begins with the filing of I-129F petition with the USCIS. The filing fee as of today is $535. That is subject to change. It may go up this year. Um, in addition to filing this petition, the petitioner, who is a U.S. citizen, need to file additional documents. So one of the documents that is extremely important for this process is a letter of intent. So this letter of intent has to be signed by both the petitioner and the beneficiary. It should basically evidence the bona fide intention to marry within 90 days of fiance's entry into the U.S. Those letters um, is something that we help prepare. What is important is that the letter is dated with the most recent date, that it's signed, that it identifies the person who signs it, and that it's submitted to the USCIS specifically for the purposes of I-129F petitions adjudication. Also, what, what we need to mention in this kind of a letter that people are not married in any other country anywhere in the world, and they are legally allowed to get married. Another requirement, which is also very important, is to prove that the beneficiary and the petitioner has, have met anywhere in the world in person within two years of filing the petition. So what it means is that the couple had to meet in person. Doesn't matter in what country. It doesn't have to be the country of the beneficiary or the country of the petitioner. For example, if there are some dangerous country conditions present 
in the beneficiary's country, then the two can meet in a third country. That's absolutely fine. And they have to meet at least once. So how to prove it? We submit photographs. For example, people travel to Paris. We submit photographs in Paris. We submit hotel reservations. We submit flight tickets, showing that people flew to the same location at the same time and things like that. We also can submit affidavits from the two people in addition to other evidence that we provide to prove that people have met within the two years. There are exceptions to this rule and I will discuss them as well. So if someone, if the couple cannot meet because of, of some traditions, some cultural norms, customs or social practice, which is, for example, present in some specific country, then we need to document that. We need to basically let the USCIS know that because of these reasons, the couple could not meet in person before they get married. Another reason uh, that can be used for this exception to apply um, can be extreme hardship to the petitioner. So if the petitioner cannot go outside of the US or meet with the beneficiary inside of the US, then the petitioner will need to prove that and will need to establish extreme hardship. I will give an example of extreme hardship that worked in the past. So the petitioner was, for example, suffering from a serious medical condition that would not allow him to travel anywhere to meet with the beneficiary and the beneficiary could not travel to the US because for example, the beneficiary did not have a visa to travel to the US, um, then it was possible to establish extreme hardship to the petitioner and file for an exception. Another thing that the petitioner will need to provide with the I-129F petition is a criminal record, if there is a criminal record. And it's not any kind of criminal record. It's limited um, only in relation to certain listed offenses. And for example, we are talking here about the child abuse, neglect, sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking. So offenses like this, um, a petitioner will need to provide a criminal record. There are also bars um, to I-129F petition in relation to the petitioners who were accused, charged, and accused, and actually convicted of certain criminal offenses related to sexual abuse. This is called the Jim Walsh um, Act, and this is something that we always discuss with the petitioners before we even take the case. We always go through the petitioner's criminal history. In terms of the procedure, um, once the petition reaches the NVC stage, the petitioner will be providing form I-134, which is called an affidavit of support. So this is different from form I-864, which is also an affidavit of support, but for an immigrant visa. Um, so I-134 affidavit of support was designed for non-immigrant visas, for some humanitarian visas, and for a K-1 visa. So the DOS, the Department of State, treats K-1 as an immigrant visa, but at the NVC and consular stage, it would not require Form I-864 affidavit of support. So instead, it's asking for I-134 affidavit of support. It's a completely different form with completely different requirements that attach to it. A set of documents that need to be provided is also slightly different. Um, we do help our clients to prepare affidavits of support form I-134. This affidavit of support um, is less legally enforceable than Form I-864. It's easier to complete this affidavit of support. And it, 
a lot of our clients just choose to do it by themselves. If they, for example, do the whole K-1 visa process by themselves and then hire us for the AOS. Form I-864, which will be required at the second step for the AOS process within the United States, is more complicated form. Um, it definitely requires more documents and more thorough preparation of the affidavit of support. Also, I would like to note that an approved I-129F petition is valid for four months. This is not to say that it cannot be revalidated. It can. Uh, however, once we have the petition approved, we suggest that our clients move to the NVC stage as soon as possible. We always move as soon as possible to submit an application for a visa and all the supporting documents to the NVC so the case could proceed to the consular processing. At the NVC stage, there will be another document for the foreign national for the fiance to complete and submit. It is form DS-160. Even though the DOS views K-1 visas as immigrant visas because of the immigrant intent, it still asks the fiancés to fill out Form DS-160, which is normally designed for non-immigrant visas. The filing fee associated with this form is $265, um, and that is to be paid to the Department of, uh, to, the, to the National Visa Center when the National Visa Center stage is right there. When we are ready to submit the documents to the NVC, that's when you will need to pay the filing fee. By the time of the interview at the consulate outside of the United States, the foreign national will need to provide police report, medical exam report, form I, um, uh, medical medical report um, with it, and also provide the proof of vaccination against COVID-19. So that's important. As for the medical exam report, we normally ask the uh, we normally ask for a standard medical report to be submitted. Even though the requirements for K-1 visa are slightly different, this medical report can be reused in the future Then the person will be applying for adjustment of status in the United States if this report um, is still valid. For the police reports, it's important to note that the police report has to be provided from every country where a foreign national resided since turning 16, according to the DOS requirements, um, the person had to reside in a foreign country for at least six months, but we normally just make sure that we provide police reports from every country where a person resided. If a person traveled to foreign countries, then you know traveling is not residing. Uh, we determine what's residing in every um, particular case that we handle. And U.S. police reports do not need to be provided because the consulates keep in touch with the FBI and they will access the files if necessary. We also always watch for country-specific document requirements. So different countries, different consulates in different countries view the process slightly different way. So it's possible that the consulate may require some additional document to be provided. For example, in one of the countries, we were required to provide proof that the person was not married in that country. So it was a very specific document that this country could produce, the government, and we obtained that document to submit to the consular officer. Here I have the K-1 visa process and timeline outlined in a nice chart, and we'll just look at this chart and go through it. So it summarizes what we've discussed so far. The K-1 petition filing um, is the very first step. The USCIS will adjudicate the K-1 petition. It normally takes 12 to 15 months, there are some delays um, related to K-1 petitions. There is even federal litigation going on related to the delays that happened during the pandemic. 
So right now, there are still slight delays with the K-1 petitions, but we see them approved within 12 to 15 months. That, of course, can take longer, depending on the current processing timelines that the USCIS has. Once the K-1 petition is approved, it goes to the National Visa Center. That takes about one, two months. That's where we submit DS-160, additional documents, affidavit of support. The case gets documentarily qualified at the NVC, and then it gets transferred to the consulate. That also takes about one, two months, and then it's up to the consulate to decide when the interview will be scheduled. Like I mentioned before, consulates are overwhelmed because they are still dealing with the consequences of the pandemic, and there may be slight delays at the consulates, but normally we see consulates scheduling interviews within, I would say, six to eight months or four to eight months, depending on the country. Some countries take extremely long time to, pro to, to actually schedule applicants for an interview. Fiance definitely needs to prepare for a K-1 interview. That interview is very thorough. It includes security questions, questions about the relationship, questions about the documents submitted. The interview will also um, cover the prior immigration history, any violations. Um, if it's determined at the time of the interview that a waiver is required, this is something that we would need to prepare and, and first, of course, discuss with the applicant. Um, so once the interview is scheduled, um, the case is definitely getting to the, the last stage of this visa process, the consular visa process. Once the interview is completed, the consulate will take two, three weeks to um, issue a visa stamp if the case is approved. If some documents are still missing, then the consulate will reach out to you or tell you that the officer will tell you that there are some documents that are still missing in the case and that you would need to provide those documents. The case can get administratively closed for this matter and the officers will wait for the additional documents or information if necessary. But normally we see visa stamps issued within two, three weeks. And visa stamp is usually valid for six months. Um, within the six months, a person needs to enter the US on this K-1 visa. We also make sure always to double check the validity dates of the visa, just to keep in mind that our client needs to enter the US within a certain period of time. When the fiance finally enters the United States, there is an obligation to get married within 90 days. This is something that absolutely has to be done for the process to go further. If marriage does not happen, then the foreign national would ha will have, unfortunately, to leave the United States because there will be no basis for that foreign national to stay in the US. Once the couple gets married in the US, and by the couple, I mean the petitioner and the beneficiary, they cannot get married to different people. Um, the foreign national can apply for a green card. So the green card process is called adjustment of status process. This is something that we do in the United States, and I have different slides to describe this process. But I can tell you that the adjustment of status process normally takes about eight to 12 months. It includes an application for an employment authorization and a travel document. It also requires us to submit Form I-485, um, an affidavit of support, Form 864. If the medical exam was submitted at the consular stage, then we can reuse the medical exam, or we may reuse it depending on when it was submitted and what date is indicated on the medical exam. But normally we're able to submit it. Even if the USCIS issues are a few response for the medical at the adjustment of status stage, we were able to argue that we have previously submitted um, the medical exam for one of our clients um, 
and that this medical exam should be reused for the AOS purposes in the United States. There are, of course, pros and cons of the K-1 visa process. So pros are that the people will need to get married in the U.S. Um, no form 864 is required at the consular stage. This is an affidavit of support, uh, which is different from form I-134, and it's more complicated. Um, to start the process, the couple does not need to get married. I know that some people are just not ready to get married um, at a certain time and they want to get married in the future so that can be beneficial. Um, cons of the process is that this process is more expensive. Um, this process has um, very uncertain wedding timeline um, for people who start the process. They first need to get the I-129F petition approved then go through the consular processing, get to the interview stage, travel to the United States, and only then get married. So the timeline may be uncertain. When a person arrives in the U.S. on a K-1 visa, the person needs to wait for an advance parole or a green card to travel internationally. Also, this person will need to apply for a work authorization in the U.S., to be authorized to work in the US before receiving a work authorization document through the adjustment of, uh, adjustment of status process. Also, there is no joint, op joint sponsor option at the consulate stage because we are filing affidavit of support form I-134. That form does not necessarily allow for a joint sponsor. Um, as opposed to form I-864, which we file for the adjustment of status process. So now when we are at the next step of the way called adjustment of status, I would like to give you um, a little explanation of this chart and the timeline that is involved in the adjustment of status process. So for this process to kick in, we first need to have the couple married in the US within the first 90 days after the arrival into the US on a K-1 visa. We start with the preparation and filing of the AOS case. That involves filing several forms at once. Form I-485 application for permanent residency, Form I-765 application for a work authorization, Form I-131, application for a travel document, medical exam form, um, if it expired, um, but normally it is still valid, so we don't file it. Um, and the last form is the affidavit of support form 864, I-864, which is a more complicated form for this specific for, for this specific process. So when we file the case, we like to file all the documents all together. Uh, when we file the case, it gets received by the USCIS within, within four to six weeks. When we have the receipt notices, we know that the case was received by the USCIS and is in process. In addition to the forms, we also submit bona fide evidence that I will talk in more detail later during this webinar. A biometrics appointment is the next step um, that normally happens within four to eight weeks after the filing of the AOS application. Once the biometrics um, are submitted, and by biometrics, I mean fingerprinting and taking a photograph at the USCIS facility, um, then the USCS can work on the work permit adjudication and a travel document adjudication and the green card case. Sometimes the USCS does not even issue work or travel permits and it issues a green card first, but normally they issue the travel and employment document within five to seven months after case is filed, which gives a nice opportunity for foreign national to work in the United States or to travel internationally while the green card is still pending with the USCIS. 
The next step is adjustment of status or green card interview. What we've seen recently is that many cases have the interview waived. So this is a new policy of the USCIS where whenever they see a very strong case without any red flags, they go ahead and approve the case without an interview. Some cases though still get scheduled for interviews and that normally happens within seven to 12 months after the case is filed. The green card normally arrives within one to two months after the interview and by itself, it can serve as the proof of work authorization and as a travel document to travel internationally. I will talk a little bit more about the AOS procedure um, and about the bona fide evidence that we submit with the forms. So like I mentioned, several forms need to get filed um, with the application for a permanent residency. Form I-693, the medical exam report, is something that we very often do not file because it's still valid. The bona fide evidence is evidence of relationship that we absolutely need to file for the adjustment of status case. So marriage is bona fide, according to the USCIS, when people entered into the marriage with an intention to live this life together as a married couple. And the evidence that the USCIS likes to see is commingling finances, joint residence, and joint experiences. These are the three categories that we take care of. We include um, tax returns, lease agreements, mortgage statements, photographs, um, flight tickets, and etc. The financial sponsorship requirements um, are different for the adjustment of status stage versus the consular processing. Form I-864 is a more complicated form that needs to be submitted to the USCIS. There are certain rules that apply to this form. So a sponsor, who's also a petitioner, must earn at least 125% of federal poverty line determined by the household size. If the petitioner files his or her federal tax returns and the petitioner is the only person indicated on the tax return, does not support anyone else, uh, has no other dependents, um, then we add the foreign national to the petitioner and we have two people in the household. Then we look at the table at the USCIS website and determine what amount of income we need to show on the federal tax return to have the sponsor, the petitioner qualified to be the sole sponsor. If we determine that the petitioner needs a joint sponsor, then this is something that we can also do for our clients. We talk to the joint sponsor, we see if the joint sponsor qualifies. Um, we can have up to two joint sponsors for the affidavit of support for the adjustment of status case. Uh, it can be a husband and wife, for example, from the same household, or it can be two completely different people. They have to be US citizens or green card holders though. How we determine if the person qualifies? We look at the tax returns. We look at the three most recent federal tax returns. Specifically, we look at the amount of total income declared on the tax return. We can also look at the assets um, if income is not enough um, to satisfy the requirements. So when we look at the assets, there are completely different calculations that we apply. And this is something that we do when we don't have people, for example, working for an employer and getting forms W-2 or 1099. The USCIS is a bureaucratic organization that likes to see forms W-2 and 1099, but this is just not the case for some people. Some people have their businesses, some people have their retirement funds um, and their bank accounts, investments. So we always look at a very specific at very specific circumstances of the case to determine what kind of income we can show 
on the affidavit of support. All right, so next is adjustment of status considerations. So what's important to keep in mind? First of all, when we are ready to move to the adjustment of status stage, we need to discuss the traveling timelines and plans because beneficiary needs to remain in the United States while the green card is pending. When the beneficiary receives a travel document, that beneficiary can travel outside of the U.S., and return on the advance parole document. That is a travel document. If the travel document hasn't arrived, then the beneficiary cannot travel without abandoning the green card case. So this is very important. Unauthorized work and unlawful presence in the United States may be forgiven for uh, the spouses of US citizens, but not for others. A person, like I said, cannot travel outside the U.S. without the green card or travel document. Once the beneficiary receives the green card, there will be a requirement for that beneficiary to spend most of his or her time in the United States. By most of the time, I mean at least 180 days or more the person would need to spend in the United States versus outside of the United States. The person would need to maintain domicile in the U.S., such as bank account, property, file taxes, register to, to vote in the um, in the uh, registration to vote actually pertains to U.S. citizens. So this is something this is something that goes to the U.S. citizens, not to the permanent residents. And it's very important for the permanent residents not to vote or register to vote in the United States. I know that a lot of people who come to the United States and receive green cards do not know about this very important rule. It, this right is reserved only for the US citizens. The government fees for filing the adjustment of status case is $535 plus $1,225. So $535 was paid initially when the person filed form I-129F um, so at this adjustment of status stage, the only filing fee that the person would need to pay will be $1,225 for form I-485 that will be filed with the USCIS. The ways to prove the bona fide marriage can be different. So like I mentioned before, there are three categories, financial documents, residential documents, and joint experiences. When we talk about the bona fide documents, evidence of marriage, we refer to photographs, proposal evidence, wedding evidence such as contracts for the wedding venue, invitations, again, photographs uh, from the wedding. We also can provide evidence of trips, um, joint experiences, events that people attended together. Uh, we also provide evidence of shared residences. I know that if the marriage is fresh, um, sometimes we just don't have um, a lot of shared residence evidence, but we at least usually are able to submit state IDs, driver's licenses, lease agreement, um, utility bills, or correspondence related to the shared residence. Another type of evidence is combined finances. So that goes to the jointly filed tax returns. Again, if the marriage is fresh, like in a K-1 case, there may not be federal tax returns or mortgage statements. But what's possible to provide in most of the cases, as we found out based on our experience, is some insurance coverage documents. If people are able um, to arrange uh, jointly owned property, buy something together, a house or cars or some other property, then we can use those documents as well. Affidavits from family and friends are always welcome. Um, however, I'd like to note that people who submit their affidavits in support of this case need to be U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents in the United States. Those are 
um, our preferences. But if you don't know anyone who's a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, then, of course, we can consider affidavits from other people, even from people from outside of the U.S. who are familiar with your relationship. There are some red flags in terms of proving a bona fide marriage. For example, age difference. Here we're talking about a significant age difference. For example, 30 years, 40 years. Um, a lot depends on how people look together. So it will be for the USCIS to basically exercise their own judgment in terms of that. Um, red flags pertaining to the differences in language, religion, cultural backgrounds can also be considered not having shared residence is a red flag for sure. Um, it's understandable that when marriage is fresh, people may not have the proof of shared residence like a lease agreement or mortgage statements, for example. But there is always an option to provide an affidavit from people who know that the married couple lives together. There is always an option to look at the utility bills. Um, and like I said, not every case will have a lot of shared residence evidence. So it's very case specific. Every case is different. Every marriage is different. And the arrangements that people have in terms of um, their lives together can also be different. Things like short engagement also is a red flag. Um, previous petitions filed on behalf of the foreign national is also a red flag. So just keep those in mind. And if any of the red flags are present in your case, then I definitely would suggest talking to an immigration attorney. The interview process uh, for the adjustment of status case um, is somewhat similar to the interview process at the consular stage. The only difference is that the petitioner and the beneficiary will need to come to the interview together if the interview gets scheduled. Interview can be waived by the USCIS, like I mentioned before, and we see that happening all the time in our most recently filed cases. If the case was very well documented, then chances are that the interview will be waived. If the interview gets scheduled, it will take place at the USCIS local office, um, very close to where you live. Uh, at the USCIS local office, there will be an officer responsible for your specific case. That officer will conduct the interview and before the interview, there will be identity verification process and also both the petitioner and beneficiary will need to swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth to the USCIS and the USCIS officer. The case will be reviewed during the interview. This is not to say that the officer would not review the case before the interview. Probably the officer would review the case before the interview. But during the interview, the case can be reviewed again. If you have any additional documents that you can bring to the interview, then that would be great. Um, that happens all the time that people wait for the interview for 8 to 12 months. And during this time frame, they are able to obtain more financial documents, more residential documents, some joint experience documents. So they can definitely bring those documents to the interview just to tell the officer that the relationship is bona fide, the marriage is valid and people have joint finances, residence, and joint experiences together. Another interesting point at the USCI, uh, in terms of the USCIS interview is that the two of you will be able to tell your story. So this is something that can definitely be done by the petitioner and the beneficiary together. And that's where you can show your emotions. That's where you can definitely provide more detail about how you met, how you decided 
um, to get engaged, how much time you spend together, what kind of hobbies you have. Um, sometimes the USCIS officers get pretty tough in terms of the story. They start asking questions about, um, for example, a bedroom setup, questions about um, certain things you do together. For example, who wakes up first and makes breakfast, how you, how you prefer to have your dinners, what colors um, of the walls you have in your apartment or house, what carpet, do you, do you have carpet floor or hardwood floor? So things like that. Sometimes um, an officer can separate the petitioner and beneficiary during the interview process um, and place them in separate rooms to be interviewed completely separately. And then the officer will be matching the answers to the same questions. So if you feel like you need an attorney to be present at the interview process, then this is something that we can always um, do. And please contact us in terms of the interview process preparation and maybe attendance of the interview in the US. So this concludes the webinar. Um, and this is the very last slide I have here. So I wanted to see if any of you have any questions for me. I'll be able to answer your questions. All right, let me look at the questions that I have here as of now. All right, so one of the questions I have is a question about inadmissibility. Um, inadmissibility is something that Inadmissibility is something that um, is indicated in the INA 212 statute. Um, that's basically a basis um, for a denial of adjustment in the United States or basis for denial of a visa outside of the United States. What kind of waiver can be used to waive a certain INA 212 ground of inadmissibility. So there are two kinds of waivers that can be processed. So one kind of waiver is a waiver for immigrant visa, and another kind of waiver is a waiver for a non-immigrant visa. Regulations are somewhat confusing, but based on the, based on the type of the visa and the way how the DOS treats the K-1 visa, it's an immigrant visa. Even though we do submit form DS-160, which is a non-immigrant visa application, the DOS and the USCIS still treats this kind of visa as an immigrant visa. So therefore, an immigrant visa waiver will need to be submitted, which is um, a waiver um, that you'll need to file with the USCIS. Not every ground of inadmissibility can be waived, uh, but certain grounds of inadmissibility can certainly be waived, or at least we can attempt to waive them. Right, next question. Can in-laws apply during the waiting period? Not sure what that means, let me see. The USCIS website says there is a three month waiting period for the I-130 petition. How long will it take for a decision? So the three month um, waiting period question is about the I-130 petition. So the I-130 petition is the petition for that we file in an immigrant visa case, not in a K-1 visa case. So this is outside of the scope of this webinar, but um, let me look. Um, so the waiting period for the I-130 petition is more than three months. According to the processing timelines, it's at least 12 months as of today, but it can take longer. Um, so I would definitely look 
at the USCIS processing timelines. I would also look at the date when the petition was filed. Normally, it takes about 12 months to get a decision on the I-130 petition, which is not a petition we file in a K-1 case. All right, so next question. Okay, so there's a clarification here that that's what the USCIS says for the petition, the company already filed. Okay, so if the petition is already filed, then there are certain updates that the USCIS provides in terms of a petition that is already pending. And sometimes I know the USCIS may say that it there is a three month waiting period that happened to some of our clients previously. Um, I wouldn't rely on this notice. It doesn't necessarily mean that the decision will be issued within the next three months. This is just a rough estimate of the timeline for that specific petition. So back to the question, can in-laws apply during the waiting period? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean by this question. Um, so if you are able to clarify, then I can answer this question. Okay, I received some clarification regarding this question. Can in-laws apply before the spousal visa decision is complete? Okay, so uh, when the visa decision is issued and the visa is issued to a spouse uh, of a U.S. citizen, let's say, to travel to the United States, then for the relatives of that foreign national spouse, it would definitely take a longer period of time for the spouse to file on behalf of the relatives. And it also depends what kind of relatives is it. If it's parents, then the foreign national needs to become a US citizen before he or she files for the parents. And that will be a completely different petition um, in a completely different process, separate process. All right, I don't see any other questions. Uh, this concludes our webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. Please have a nice day, nice week, and enjoy the summer. Hopefully the weather is great where you live and we're hoping we'll get some sunny days in Chicago this weekend. Thank you and have a nice day. Bye.